We're back on our expedition through the book of Exodus. We've made it up to chapter 17. And in chapter 17, you got water from the rock. Israel's complaining again because they're thirsty. And the Lord has Moses take the rod back out again and smite the rock to get them some water. And it says in Exodus 17, 6, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So, this rock, remember, Jesus Christ is the rock that gave water. And Paul confirms that in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. So when you realize that everything in the Old Testament pictures something in the New Testament, the Bible will become even more alive to you. The Old Testament and the New Testament go together. Um, the New Testament reveals the Old Testament. You got all these doctrinal statements and statements in the New Testament. You get the stories to match those statements in the Old Testament. Whenever you see a great truth in the New Testament, you can go back there in the Old Testament and you got a story to go along with it. And in 1 Peter 2, 8, it calls Jesus Christ a stumbling stone and rock of offense. He is our rock. In Matthew 6, 18, Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church. Jesus Christ is this rock. In Deuteronomy 32, 31, it says, Their rock is not as our rock. And that's true. John 1, 1 through 3, that's true because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So you did come from a rock, but that rock is the Lord Jesus Many people think they came from a rocks or something, but uh, they got the wrong rock. But next, in Exodus 17, you got the fight with Amalek. Israel gets in battle with Amalek, and you'll notice something special. When Moses has his hands up, Israel prevails in the battle. When he puts his hands down, they start losing the battle. In Exodus 17, 11, it says, And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So this pictures lifting up our hands in prayer. In 1 Timothy 2, 8, it says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So Moses' hands get heavy, so Aaron and Hur lift them up. In Exodus 17, 12, but Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him. There's your stone right there, the Lord Jesus, a stone of stumbling, rock of offense. He's the chief cornerstone, so they put it under him. So your foundation is the Lord Jesus, and he set their own. And Aaron and Hur, there's your brother's, and the Lord stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So that's a great picture there, a picture of prayer. Your hands are up in prayer. It's going to help you win the battle. So this picture is the saints lifting you up in prayer as well. And the battle's won. It says in Exodus seventeen thirteen, and Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So notice it wasn't just the prayers, it was also the edge of the sword, once again picturing something, 
the Word of God. Because Hebrews 4.12, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the Word of God is a sharp two-edged sword, sharper than any two-edged sword. Also, don't forget that Joshua himself is a picture of the Lord Jesus, and victory is won through his words. Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Exodus seventeen fourteen, And the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. So when God gives you victory, write it down in a journal or something. Remember it. Write down the victories in the Lord and put out the memory of the enemy. He wanted him to write this in a memorial in a book. But he also said, I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek. Proverbs 10, 7 says, The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. And in Exodus eighteen eleven, looking at Exodus 18, it says, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. For in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. So, the Lord is greater than all gods. Any god you can think of, any god that man is worshiping today, he's greater than all gods. And, you know, insert random god's name, and you can mark it down that the Almighty is greater than that god. You can put the little greater than symbol that you used in math class. And put that towards the Lord. He he just made an absolute fool out of all the gods of Egypt and the plagues. And you know how when you're uh, getting in a fight with like a, a little guy. And a little guy comes at you. And you just stick out your, your hand out. Lay it on his head. And use the palm of your hand on his head to just keep him back. And his arms are flinging in front of his body. But none of them are hitting you. That's how the Lord handles the gods that way. They can't touch him. They're, they are so pale in comparison. It's actually a lot worse than that. But you, you could never think of an illustration to do it justice. You know, you, imagine you got a big, you had all the ants in the world. You got the toughest ant in the whole world. And he's, all the other ants are scared of him. Yet he comes up to you and you can just squish him. And he's dead. Uh, that's, it's even worse than that. When you compare Almighty God to all the gods in the world, you get the toughest false god come up against the Almighty. He's going to squish him under his feet. It's just pale in comparison. And in Exodus chapter 18, what you also have is Moses' father in law's advice, Jethro. So Jethro is given this advice, and it says in Exodus eighteen sixteen through 18, When they have a matter, they come unto me, this is Moses talking, and I judge between one and another. And I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. So people come to Moses with their problems. He's their spiritual guide. Because, you know, he's the one that's talking to God. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away, both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. So, so Moses' father-in-law, he's telling Moses, you know, this is too much. You need to get some of these men to help you. So Moses took Jethro's advice, and he chose able men out of all Israel for the job and put a certain amount of people under each man, so they would go to that specific man with these little problems. And then the children of Israel would go to these men with the little problems. But for the big problems, those uh, men over them would come to Moses and ask him. So Jethro's advice actually was not good. It just sounds good. And this is an example of worldly wisdom. A lot of times older people can give you advice. And as a general rule... Older people are going to be wiser. They've been around longer. Maybe they've been reading the Bible longer, been doing 
doing the Christian life longer. And you have to listen closely, though, to what they say because what they say could be wise in a worldly sense and sound really good to the years. And it works to a certain extent, but it's not real Bible wisdom many times. And I don't know how many times I've, I've heard older people tell me that I need to slow down, just take care of me, or that I need to put myself first. Or if I'm the one that's happy, that's all that matters. All that sounds good, but it's actually wrong. Uh, just because you're older, just because they're older doesn't mean they're going to give good advice. Just because somebody's younger don't mean they'll give bad advice. It's all about you filter it through the Bible. And in Deuteronomy 34, 7, I want to read you this verse in a minute. But Jethro's advice to Moses was about uh, distributing out the work to others because he was going to wear away. He thinks Moses is going to get old and tired and worn down. Yet when you get to Deuteronomy, Moses lived to be 120 years old. And he hadn't lost any of his physical ability. In Deuteronomy 34, 7, And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. So when he went to the eye doctor... He was seeing just like a teenager. Um, nothing was going away for Moses. Nothing was wearing away. When it comes to longevity, he makes Tom Brady and LeBron James look like some amateurs. He makes them look like some rookies. Uh, Jethro also said, For this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. But he told him he's going to wear away. I mean, the Lord made it to where Israel's shoes didn't even wear away on their feet. Remember that. He tells them, this thing's too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Not true, Jethro. It's not too heavy. Because remember in Exodus 3, 11 through 12, And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go into Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And now look what the Lord said. When Moses is, you know, being extra, extra meek and humble. He said, certainly I will be with thee. You know, he's pretty much saying, Moses, you can't do it on your own. This is too great for you. You know, who? yeah, who are you to do it? But you can do it because certainly I will be with thee. So obviously this thing is not too heavy for Moses. And he's not going to perform it himself alone. The Lord's going to be with him. So nothing's too heavy for the Lord, and he promised Moses he would never leave him. So Jethro's advice is not good. It just sounds good. And worldly wisdom sounds good, but it's not actually good. Now, chapter 19, God meets with Israel at Mount Sinai. It says in Exodus 19.4, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. So they saw what he did. And the Jews require a sign. How much more sign do they need? He says, Now therefore, if you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Just as Israel is a peculiar people, me and you today, we're not Israel, but we're also a peculiar people. It says in Titus 2.14, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. If you are a Christian, then you should be different. There should be something different about you everywhere you go. People ought to see you different at work and at school than they do all the other people there. And you can tell if they see you different. In 1 Peter 2, 9, it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness and is a marvelous light. So you're a peculiar people yourself. In Exodus 19, 6, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So not only... As children of Israel, priests, we're also priests as Christians. 
We offer up spiritual sacrifices. We don't sacrifice animals, but we do spiritual sacrifices. Romans 12, 1 says to present your bodies a living sacrifice. And he told uh, Israel that they'll be a holy nation. Peter also said that we are a holy nation. Uh, it, back there in that verse I just read, 1 Peter 2, 9. And that's why I don't get too worried about who's going to be president or what's going on in the government because my real citizenship is in heaven. Ephesians 2, 6 says, He hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm more of a citizen of heaven than I am of America. And in Exodus 19, 7, And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words, all these words which the Lord commanded him. So he laid all these words in front of them. He didn't try to correct them. He didn't try to change them or polish them. And although Israel may have had some conditional agreements going on with the Lord here, in the grand scheme of it all, the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is unconditional. No matter what they do, there's going to be a, a remnant of Israel that gets the promise that was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In Exodus 19, 8 through 9, all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. Notice that Moses is acting as a mediator. Moses is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our mediator. 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So you see, everything's a picture. The Bible's a picture book. It's not just black words on white, white paper. It's got more pictures than a comic book. In Exodus 19, 11, And be ready against the third day, for the third day will the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. You see, the children of Israel, they walk by sight. Me and you today, we walk by faith, not by sight. In Exodus nineteen sixteen, it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people was in the camp that was in the camp trembled. You see... They're afraid. God is a fearful being. Just like when John saw Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 1, he fell at his feet as dead. You see, you won't cuss God when you meet him. You'll bow down in fear. Job 41 says Leviathan, you know, Satan in his natural state, it says he's without fear. But one day, he will bow to Jesus Christ and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. In Philippians 2, 10 through 11, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow. Everyone will tremble. In Exodus nineteen seventeen through 18, And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount, and Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. Look at these things associated. Smoke. Smoke is kind of spooky. Fire. That's intimidating. Earthquakes. That's terrifying. You see, this isn't just some grandpa coming down in a rocking chair to tell you a little story. This is God Almighty. And verse 19, And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai and the, on the top of the mount. And the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, charge the people lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. So Moses is getting called up there. He's going to get all these revelations from God. God tells him, you know, make sure the people don't come up, because if they come up, they're going to die just by looking at me. And no doubt you would have some crazies and sneaky kids trying to break through and take a peek. Just, but just looking at the Almighty can kill you. But now Moses, in chapter 20, Look at chapter 20. Moses is going to get the Ten Commandments. 
Exodus 20 and verse 3, the Lord says to Moses these commandments. He says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You see, the Lord should be first and foremost in your life. 1 Thessalonians 1 9 says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. The Lord should be first and foremost. Exodus 20 and verse 4 Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You see, people make images out of wood out of stone, out of whatever they can get their hands on. They got false gods like Moloch. He had a statue made to look like him. People would sacrifice their own kids to it. And some people make statues of just regular men on the earth and bow down to it like Buddha or something. And some people have an image or of something that's in the water under the earth. This could be false gods like Dagon the fish god who the Lord knocked flat on his face in 1 Samuel. And then he says in Exodus 20 and verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. You see, the Lord is a jealous God. The Lord's name is Jealous, Exodus thirty-four fourteen. 14. And don't get mad at that. You should be flattered that he's jealous for you. You should be flattered that he wants your attention instead of you giving it to a God who can't see, hear, or walk. Just like you should be flattered if your spouse is jealous over you. Don't take that as an insult. If they're jealous over you, that means that they still love you. If they're not jealous of over you, maybe that's a cause for concern. In Exodus 20 and verse 6, it says, Showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Wouldn't it be awful if we had a God that didn't show mercy? Imagine if the almighty God who made the sun and the moon and the stars and black holes and galaxies was actually a mean God. We would be doomed. That would be completely terrifying. But he shows mercy. He's a merciful God. He says in Exodus 20 and verse 7, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Some people will pretend to be on the Lord's side. Some people will use the Lord's name to further their plan or agenda when they actually don't care anything about the Lord. They pretend to love the Bible, but they just teach the commandments of men, but they put the Lord's name on it. And in Matthew 15, 9, it says, But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Or what about those songs that are ungodly, and yet they use the Lord's name to make a quick dollar off of Christians, or movies that claim to be godly, they put the Lord's name in it and make a lot of money, but it's not really godly at all. It seems taking the Lord's name in vain goes beyond just saying OMG or GD. You know, I would say that using the Lord's name to justify something sinful or to give it some type of credibility to Christians when it's actually not godly at all, uh, that's more of taking the Lord's name in vain, even worse than someone saying, you know, GD or OMG. You know, half the time when somebody says that, they don't even, they're not even a Christian, so they don't even have the right God. They're cussing some other God. But when you put the name of Jesus Christ on something sinful and claim that it's godly, and also having a wicked motive, that takes it to another level there. In Exodus 20 and verse 8, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember that the Sabbath is a sign given to Israel. In Exodus 31, 13, it says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. And in regards to the Sabbath, Paul says in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, let, therefore no man, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And in Romans 14, 5, Paul says, one man esteemeth one day above another. Another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And I don't want to get in my mind that there's one day that I set aside for the Lord. I want to do the same for the Lord every day. And some people only open their Bible on Sunday. 
Some people think uh, Saturday is the way to go. You know, Saturday is the Sabbath, but we're not required to keep the Sabbath. Uh, I make sure that I live in my Bible every day. I make it my hobby, my buddy, my best friend, my thing I do when I'm bored, the thing I do when I'm not bored. Keep one in the car, keep one in the house, on your phone. Carry your main Bible around with you. Uh, you know, separate every day for the Lord. We don't have to keep the Sabbath because Jesus Christ is our Sabbath and he keeps us. In Exodus 29 through 10, it says, Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, and it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. This is a good principle to live by. You need to labor. And most jobs require at least five days of labor. Right now, it can be hard to find one that doesn't require seven days of labor. But keep a proper balance to it as much as you can. Don't underwork to where you can't provide for your family. You know, 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, you have to deny the faith and is worse than the infidel. So you need to labor. But at the same time, you don't want to work so much that you don't have time for God and the family. So for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth to see and all that in them is and rested the seventh day before the Lord blessed the Sabbath, Sabbath day and hallowed it. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So you want to live longer? Honor your parents. Some people have wicked parents, but they can still show them respect. Parents are given to guide you. Foolishness is bound the heart of a child. God wants the parents to drive it out of them. Exodus 20, 13 says, Thou shalt not kill. Sometimes they show pictures of these killers when they were kids or a teenager. And I guarantee you that at that time, the killer had no idea he was going to grow up and be a killer. You see, sin is progressive. It gets worse and worse. And killing is glorified in the games and the music, and people just don't value life as much. <clears throat> and what always got me was how the killer himself wants to stay alive. Well, doesn't he think the victim would like to stay alive as well? And Paul calls murder unrighteousness in Romans one twenty nine, obviously. And if time lasts, murder will be seen as something that someone just can't help that people are going to have sympathy for, uh, that's done for fun, for sport, and probably in some ways legal. I mean, it already is legal if if you consider abortion and stuff, but man gets worse and worse. And uh, thou shalt not kill, Exodus twenty thirteen. Thou shalt not commit adultery, Exodus twenty fourteen. Don't be unfaithful to your spouse, and step out on them. Don't go after another man's wife and cause her to step out on her husband. And that's just being a really crummy idiot when you do that. <clears throat> Thou shalt not commit adultery. You see adultery promoted everywhere, though. A person may not be committing adultery physically, but they many times do it inwardly. And I've heard fathers comment on other women that wasn't their son's mother right in front of their son and it trains him to do the same thing and it puts him in that mindset and you see nobody can be faithful today it's a rare thing so you see how these commandments are are only for our good i mean a lot of people look at the bible and they're like oh no the the, the commandments in the bible oh it's terrible i mean what's wrong with thou shalt not commit adultery you want your spouse to commit adultery on you What's wrong with thou shalt not kill? You want somebody to kill you? What's wrong with Exodus 20, 15, thou shalt not steal? You want somebody to steal from you? Ephesians 4, 28, Paul says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may give, that may that he may have to give to him that needeth. So let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor. So instead of going around stealing, why don't you just get a job and work? And you see how Paul 
reinforces this, these same commandments. You know, it said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Paul said in Hebrews 13, 4, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. It said, Thou shalt not steal. He said, Let him that stole steal no more. You see, just get up, go to work, and you won't have to steal. Start working today. Don't buy things you don't need. Don't get in over your head. Use your money wisely, and you won't have to steal to get by. Um, Exodus twenty sixteen: Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Don't lie. What's wrong with that commandment? You want somebody to lie to you? Colossians 3, 9 says, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Exodus 20, 17, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, or nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. So don't, don't covet. That's a good commandment. You want somebody coveting your stuff? You want somebody desperately wanting your house, your wife, your car, your whatever you have, Paul backs this up. He says in Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So these things are still for today. Other than the Sabbath, you don't have to keep the Sabbath because Jesus is your Sabbath and he keeps you but the rest of them, all for today.